Hey guys, welcome to another video, a walkthrough video. Uh, we're going to talk about particle text morphing. Uh, you saw the introduction video, so that's the type of stuff we'll be doing. Uh, it will be, as I said, a walkthrough, not a full tutorial. Uh, the walkthrough will be about the five templates I've made available on my website, www.ablackbirdcalledsue.com. So after downloading, you can start using them. And this video may come in handy to help you. Now, after we've done the sort of the walkthrough, I will tell you a bit about how it all works underneath the hood. Not to the nth degree in terms of detail. I won't explain all the expressions, but at least so that you understand the flow and that you can then also modify the flow and modify some key things. But as I said, with the walkthrough itself, you will be able to modify all the key aspects like the text itself, the fonts, the color, the speed, uh, and, and things of that nature. But the more technical stuff will be at the end of the video. So let's dive right into it. So this is the very first template and we'll be focusing especially on this one whilst I explain the concept. So the first thing you will see or you may see is the second P custom note. You can safely ignore it. You can even delete it. It was a, a sort of a legacy node. It works a bit faster than the P custom node that is in here, but it can only work with uh, white pixels in the input text, right? And whereas the one in here right now can work with full color. So let's jump into the main node or the main node for you guys, probably the main text node. This is where you see in the styled text field, you'll see the text appearing, right? As the timeline moves along, you'll see the different pieces of text appearing, or the different strings. So this is governed by this array underneath here in this expression. It's a fairly small expression, but I won't explain it, explain it as part of this walkthrough. But what you want to do is, here is basically change the text to what you want. And you can, of course, also add or delete elements. So very important. It's probably the key thing you want to change. Of course, there you can change the font as well. Actually, out of the box, this may uh, give you an error message because you may not have Roboto, 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 whatever, installed. It's a free font. I love it myself. I've used it in uh, various um, tutorials and I use it in my own work. Uh, so I would really encourage you guys to download it. It's a, it's, it's a free or donationware. I can't quite recall. Uh, if it is donationware, I should really donate something because I've used it in uh, these tutorials. Um, having said all of that, so uh, if you don't have it installed, it will generate an error message. You can, of course, change the text size, um, but just be mindful that it should fit the canvas. And then there are a few other aspects you need to be careful of. Uh, more on that later. Uh, so as I said, you can change the text here. But next one up then, uh, title speed and morph speed. So the title speed basically tells you how long does it take for a title to be on screen. Right? Uh, for the first 150 frames, right, it will show the first string Black Magic Fusion. And then for the next 50 frames, it will uh, basically morph from the first text to the second one. Right? Um, and then after that, at frame 300, it will basically start morphing onto the next uh, text element. So uh, the only weird thing I suppose I never thought of that is that the first title uh, will be there for a bit longer. Well, as a matter of fact, it will be built up a bit. So the first text is treated a bit differently than all the subsequent ones. Right? Just, just bear that in mind. And you saw that in the introduction video anyways. And of course, you can change uh, the shading, uh, shading of the first shader here as well. Right? You can change it to red text or whatever you want to choose. But uh, what's important then uh, is that there's an instance, so that's sort of a copy of the text node, and the copy follows all the changes you would make in the main node, apart from elements that have been de-instanced. Right, so in this node, I've de-instanced the second shader. And the second shader, right, let me show that here, as you can sh see here, that has got this sort of a blurred out glow effect. And that's very important because these pixels will generate some of these particles you see moving around the text that gives it that swirly feel. So very important, but you can give that of course a different color. And if you want that to be larger, right, you can you know add some softness to it, 
right? Increase that, but also you may want to increase the thickness as well. Uh, but play around with it, right? But these settings are all vary across the different templates. One thing I forgot to mention uh, briefly, but importantly, in the text tab, styled text, unfortunately, whenever you save the template, it seems to lose the instancing. So that means that whenever you change the text here in the expression, in the array, it doesn't auto update it here. So what you will need to do is basically right click and choose reinstance. Okay. So whenever you see weird results, something's weird going on with the text, do double check that. So again, I don't know why this is happening, why it doesn't retain the instancing, but uh, at least on my system, it doesn't. So take that into account. Okay. So, and then you've got the third one that is, well, it's not really a third one. Then there's an other time speed now that takes the instance and that delays it and that helps with the morphing but more on that later when i start explaining about the underneath the hood type stuff so um the next thing in terms of a an end user you want to do is basically you've changed the text you've changed the color you've changed the font and everything and it's all good um you've changed the morph speeds then there are a few things you need to do by hand to ensure it all works properly so first off Go to the background node here and then to the rectangle. Well, you don't have to go to the background node first, but in any case, go to the rectangle and ensure that this is large enough to encompass, encompass your text. And if it's too small, you won't see your text fully appearing. Um, depending on the size of the sort of the glow effect around it, you may want to alter this. And in some of the other templates, it may need to be really large if you have like a background image here. Okay, so I always have a bit of leeway here, but if you make it too large, just bear in mind that more particles will be generated, even though you may not see the particles. So it definitely has got a performance uh, impact. Second thing you need to take into account in terms of these box boxes is the bounce box, right? That's here in the region tab of the bounce P bounce node. Uh, this will basically ensure that particles will bounce back. Particles will, particles will only be generated on the very first frame. So if you wouldn't have a bounce box, then over time more and more will disappear because of the turbulence node that make the particles that makes the particles move. Right? So very important that you set it to the appropriate size. So at least as big as the initial rect rectangle, but you may want to make it a bit bigger depending on the effect you're after. Okay. Uh, then the next one up in the P image emitter lifespan incredibly important so this needs to be as long as your composition and your composition is of course determined by the number of text elements you have in the array and the title speed and morph speed right um, I could have automated it all but I didn't so it is something you will need to do by hand so ensure that this is large enough if it is not then everything will disappear after, you know, frame 550. Very, very important. Uh, if you want to have more particles, right, if it seems all too sparse, so if you drop this in here, if you want to have, see more stuff here uh, or more around it and such, you can increase the density. Um, in this particular case, I didn't think it looked good, so I kept it uh, at these values, but in some of the other templates, you will see that it's higher. The downside, of course, is that the higher the value, the more particles will be generated and the slower it all gets to view and to render. And so important. Um, alpha threshold, I would not touch that because that basically ensures that uh, non or transparent uh, pixels will not generate any particles, right? It's the threshold. Um, turbulence. You may want to change if you want to see that swirly effect going a bit faster increase the x and y strength or right? oh, one of them or if you feel adventurous put any of the other type of particle forces in here right? or replace it with or add it to or whatever right um, you can do it all the bounce as such i would not change 
And then that's basically pretty much it. If you want to get even more adventurous, you can change a few things in the P custom itself. I didn't add a parameter for that. Uh, my apologies for that. I ran out of time and I need to concentrate on some other projects. But for instance, here on the particle tab, uh, you can change the value 2.2 .2 here. The higher the value there, the more static this text will be right when it's being displayed. If you've got a fairly low value, you see the text waving a bit. I didn't actually use that in any of my introduction video, but if you use the values of say anything over one, sort of, sort of like 1.3, you'll see the text depending on the font and such sort of waving a bit. It can be quite a cool effect. Um, if you want to get even more adventurous, change the size expression here. Gets a bit complicated, but um, especially the parameter here, the four or the value here. Um, if you decrease this, you'll basically see more happening around here. If you increase this, more and more is confined to the text itself. And it will sort of decrease the, the thickness of the text and such. There's also the one or two you can change, but just have a play with it. I won't explain it all here. Um, Finally, then it gets rendered out in the P render. In this particular one, I'm adding a soft glow. Be careful if you set the gain or glow too high, you get a bit of a flickering result. So I would be very careful here. And especially if you render with uh, sort of high X density values and such, and you know, lots of particles that can, can take a while and then you render everything. And after half an hour, when you come back, you see a sort of a flickering result. Um, that's not what you want to have. So don't say you haven't been warned. Lastly, there's a merge here and I'm adding a very, very simple background. But of course you can change this to like a gradient, right? Um, and make say a radio gradient and, you know, uh, sorry, let me show this here. Change it here. Pick a blue, pick another blue here. Right, you got this type of effect. Uh, it can all be pretty cool, but you know you know how it works. And of course, finally, you do want to add a saver, add a saver, uh, and save your work out. And that's basically how it works. The template. Oh, uh, one more thing. Uh, in the image emitter, the style of the actual particle. I'm using a bitmap here, which is just a fast noise node, a very small one. Um, you can change that to anything, of course, you know, play around with it, or you can change it to one of the internal ones like a blob or a line or whatever. You can get really interesting results. Uh, you may need to play a bit with the uh, size setting here, the size expression, if it all becomes too weird for you. Right? So, but you just play around with it. In one of the other templates, I'm using, for instance, the blob particle rather than the uh, build-in uh, or rather than the fast noise. Um, I think that's everything to it for this template. And I'll just quickly show you a few of the other ones, right? In this one, the subtle release version, I am changing it or I've changed the particle and set it to blob and it makes it all a bit smaller and you get a more well-defined, uh, thinner text, and especially with this Roboto or Roboto, Roboto font. Uh, I didn't change much else here. Um, so yeah, there we go. So that's, that works quite nicely, I think. This is an interesting one, right? I've added a background image here. Here it is static, but it doesn't need to be static, right? It could be a video of some kind. And uh, you, you've saw the sort of in the, um, you've seen it in the introduction where I've got a, an image of an actual, I think it's an, an alleyway and it's, it's a photo and, um, and that works quite well. Uh, you may want to increase the density, though, of the P image emitter to ensure you've got sufficient particles around here. And as I said before, you do need to ensure that your box here or your mask is uh, sufficiently large. Now, in terms of the background image, right, that is happening here. In this case, it's just a text node, right? And I'm masking that a bit with the original text so that it's a bit, bit masked out here, right? It's a bit... Uh, the opacity has been decreased here. And then I ensure that that will be merged with the original text and goes then into the P custom. And then the delayed version of the text 
will have a separate merge node, right? you can see it here, and it will be added. And then I ensure that the opacity here in the shader is set sufficiently low. In this particular case, I've animated it as well so that at frame zero, it's set to zero, and then it slowly comes up. All right, so um, that is basically how you deal with a background image and it can work really, really well. Uh, next one up, I've got this fiery type template and the difference here is apart from the fact that I use a type of um, radial gradient around here with the texture tool, and, uh, not much is different apart than of the trails tool. So the trails tool is an interesting one and you always have to be a bit careful with it because it takes into account the previous, uh, the pixel values of the previous frame and then does some magic with it. Um, but when you start dealing with it, like if I now go to frame zero, oh, sorry, let me, uh, like here, you st at frame zero, you still see what you just saw, right? The value at, uh, what was it, frame 100, because it took into account the previous frame. So it's sort of real time calculating it. So when you play around with it and you go to different times, just ensure that from time to time you hit restart. So it will restart the calculations, okay? Now let's quickly jump into Resolve and then I'll show you guys how to put a few of these renders together so that you can get something that resembles what we had in the introduction of this video. Now here in Resolve, uh, you can see that I imported a bunch of uh, files, movie files. These are the renders of the individual templates. Uh, important to mention here is that I used all the same or pretty much all the same parameters, like the same words, the same title speed, the same morph speed. And the whole reason here is that it makes cutting between them a lot easier. Of course, this is optional as much in life, things are option, optional, uh, but it makes it, as I said, a lot easier to cut. So let's uh, dive right into it and start editing. So let's start with the subtle one. Let's drag it in here into the video one. And as you can see here, it's the subtle one. So let's say we want to start with that, go to particle text morph, and as of that one, that point, we want to cut to what do we want to cut to, to the, say the, say the fiery one. We drag it in here. Now, I'm not saying this is the fastest way of cutting. Uh, I'm not a great resolve expert. Other people are much, much, much better than I am. I'm really a beginner. But the way I do it is I just go to the race tool, cut it here, cut it here, go back to the selection tool, backspace to the lead here, backspace to the lead here drag it down and then add a cross this off. And what we get then is basically goes here, particle text morph, then it goes to the fiery text and it continues here. And let's say at this point, we wanna go to the one with the binary background. So we do the same thing, drag it in here and cut it here, go to the raise tool, cut it here, cut it here, and selection tool, delete it here, delete it here, Drag it back down, head across this off, bang, done. So now it will transition into the binary one. What I did do in the introduction video itself is then I slowed this one down. That gave a pretty cool effect, so I thought. So what we can do that, we can do that here, uh, change clip speed, ensure that the ripple sequence is selected and say we make it 50%, change it. And now when we go full screen, we get something like this. Right, first the subtle text and a transition there or morphing. Then it transitions to the fiery one and then into the binary one. And you can see here it slows down and I think that looks pretty cool. Right, and then of course you can go to the next one, etc. Now, of course, what you can also do is pop a video underneath it like so. Right, and uh, then also let's change the clip speed here, but ensure that ripple sequence is not selected. And say set this to 50% as well, and then drag it out. So, of course, oops, at first 
you won't see a thing because this is pure black. The way I rendered it out, there's no alpha or anything. So what we can do is go to the composite mode, change it to add. Same for this club clip, sorry, change to add. And for this one, change it to add. And what we get then, when we go to full speed, full screen rather, you get this effect. And I think that looks pretty good. Right? You may want to do some color correction and such, but you get the gist of it. Right? So um, if you're not interested in the underneath the hood stuff, then I'm glad you watched it so far at least. I hope you guys enjoyed it and see you guys next time. And for those folks uh, interested in the underneath the hood detailed stuff, hang on, we're going back to Resolve, uh, to Fusion even. Back to Fusion, and here we are. Let's go back to template one. So, as promised, I'll tell you a bit about how this works underneath the hood. So, on the left hand side, right, we've got this box here. Right, it's just a background with a rectangular node, and this basically is an input to the P image emitter, and it basically means particles will be emitted according to this image. Now, we've got to be a bit careful because by default, you would think no particles are being emitted here but you'd be wrong particles are being admit, emitted but they would just have um, a color value of well zero 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 for rgb and an alpha of zero but the particles would still be there and it would still have an impact on your system so in the p image emitter we want to ensure that in the control step the alpha threshold is above zero and it should be a small value uh, of course as you increase it you wouldn't have any boundary pixels and such, uh, or you know, semi-transparent stuff. But to be honest, for our purposes here, a block is sufficient. This block just needs to cover the initial distribution or even the distributed particles. Right? It's the starting point. Uh, we could have done it without this. We could have done it with a normal emitter and then have a rectangle or circular or whatever. Also possible, also equally valid. I just thought that it was a good idea doing it this way because you got a uniform distribution of the particles. Now, uh, in the P image emitter itself, right? I've said it in the uh, previous bit in the walkthrough, you've got the density settings to play with. The higher the density, the more pixels will be produced. And we're using the fast noise to uh, as an input for the style. Uh, turbulence, we've gone through that. P-bounds, we've gone through it. But let's talk about this bit. This is really where the magic happens and it can get a bit complicated. Um, as said in the walkthrough, the my array, or the array here called my array, has got the different text uh, elements in there. And uh, the way it works, I've explained it in another tutorial, but essentially it's looking at the title speed and it jumps ahead as soon as it hits multiples of the 150, right? So it is doing that by using the seal function. It's just a standard sort of Lua function. Uh, morph spe speed we already explained, so I don't need to say an awful lot about it right now, but we'll get into that in a moment. So we, as we said in the introduction, we've got here an instance of the main text and that really governs the colors of the particles around it. Also the inside, right, the text itself, but it's a straight copy or it's an instance of the main text, right? You'll see that on shader one, that will just copy over or it will reflect, or they will always be uh, equated to each other, right? It's a standard, standard instancing. But when you go to the second shader, uh, this has been disabled, so it's not, it's not sort of the instancing has been disabled. I can re-instance it, but I don't want that because the main text itself, that's being used to drive the first P custom. So in the first P custom, you've got a velocity X expression, which is making use of an intermediate expression here. And this is a type of standard expression, get A1B, and then it reads out the pixel values. Uh, and I need to offset it by half because of the fact that uh, in an image, it starts at 
uh, zero and it ends at one, right? But with a particle system, that is not the case. And so you need to sort of compensate for that. Um, so it basically reads the pixel values and the alpha value of the pixels. Then it uses that in the uh, particle tab and it basically says if the input pixel of this image, if the alpha value is less than one, right? So basically everything around the text here, then keep the same velocity. And so any particles generated that are not going directly over the text, if you will, uh, they will keep their velocity. However, if the alpha value is one, so where the text is itself, like here, then it will start slowing it down. It basically divides the velocity by 2.2, .2, right? Um, you can play around with these values, but essentially the higher the value, the more static the text will become, right? Uh, if you've got uh, quite a low value, something like 1.2, then it may appear a bit wavy, which can be quite a nice effect. And I think I explained that in the walkthrough as well. But that's the way that works. But that doesn't do anything in terms of the actual um, the color and such. So if I disable this P custom for now and let it re-render, there you can see what happens when you don't do anything really with the second P custom, right? And if we would have had colored text, all of a sudden, despite the color, it would all appear as, uh, as one, right? As the original white color, because I said the magic is happening here. So let's re-enable that. Okay, we're back. Um, so this has now been re-enabled. So in the second P custom, it's using a bunch of intermediate expressions and again, as with the other one, it's reading the pixel values of the input images. So that's uh, plural, right? So there's uh, the original instance and the time delayed version. Right? And that's important. And this is basically what enables the morphing. So it's in the intermediate um, expressions, it's reading the RGB and alpha of image one and in five, six, seven, and eight of image two. And then depending on where we are in the morphing stage, um, it will alter the appearance by basically saying, okay, if it's at the start of the morphing sequence, take everything of image one. And, but if it's at the end, everything's of image two and in between, of course, it's a sort of a weighted average. So that's done with these expressions and it's making use of, what is that number? in one, right, which you can see is set to zero here. If I move ahead one frame, as you can see, oh, maybe I should show the instance here and here, this is the time delayed one, right? And here you can see number in one increasing and it will take 50 frames until it gets to value one and then it will be fully transitioned. So as of that point, it will take uh, the uh, all the values from this image here, right? The instance main text. So it will have transitioned from the old one, time delayed one, to the new one. So that's basically how the morphing works. So it's taking more and more pixels of the non-time delayed one, the original one, and so it will slowly transition to that one. Hopefully that makes sense. And um, I think that's pretty much everything that's to it. Well, <laughs> uh, later on, I thought maybe I should have really reversed uh, the sequence here. This, this should have been um, image one and this should, be, should have been image two. But as I alluded to before, I ran out of time. This works as is, but from a logical perspective, it may have been better to do it the other way around, but I left it as is. So um, that's everything there is to say, I think, about this. Uh, and I said I didn't want to go into great detail, just some of the detail. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this. If you've got any questions about this, uh, let me know. Leave me a comment or drop me an email at ablackbirdcoldsu at gmail.com. Okay, thanks guys, and I'll see you next time. Take care, bye.